Well, hello, my lovely people. I am so sorry that I'm out sick today, but I do have a lovely warm up ready for you. So make sure that you have a periodic table, a calculator, and your warm ups available. And um, if you could take a minute just to kind of pause right here on the video so that people can write down what the warm up is and actually think about it before you press play on this video. So at this point, I do want the sub to just kind of pause right here so that people can write down the question and actually think about it before we start. All right. Okay, so hopefully now you're ready to think about this question now. So the very first thing that you guys have to think about is what is the balanced reaction? And obviously this question has to do with the mini rocket lab that we started last class. So the very first thing that you have to realize is that you can't do any work yet on this question until you actually have a balanced reaction. So I'm gonna refresh your memory and we'll take a closer look at the problem itself. So I'm gonna refresh your memory on that balanced reaction. So um, we had some hydrogen gas and some oxygen gas reacting to make some water. Okay, so there's the reaction. And to balance it, what we had to do was to place some coefficients in front of the hydrogen and in front of the water. Okay. Now, in the warm-up, it said that you guys had to figure out the maximum amount of water that can be made when you have one part of hydrogen and five parts of oxygen. And they want to know the maximum amount of water that can be made. So you're going to need to do a stoichiometry problem that will take you from parts, which really, really, in this case, we're talking about moles, okay? We're not, when we say parts, we're actually talking about moles. And when you were filling up those rockets with various uh, ratios, I hope you realize that those ratios were kind of like mole ratios. So if we take a closer look at the little rocket that you guys were filling up, you know, and we had um, some ratios going on here. Technically, in this problem, what you are doing is you're filling it up with a certain amount of hydrogen and a certain amount of oxygen. So in this particular question, what you're kind of doing is you're filling it up with one part hydrogen, and then you're filling up the remainder of it with the five parts of your oxygen. So we'd fill all of the remaining with our oxygen gas. And when we allow the hydrogen and oxygen to burn, Obviously, we're going to make some of this stuff in the inside make some water, right? And that reaction was so explosive and so awesome that it actually allowed the rocket itself to propel and move forward. What a really cool uh, lab, and I hope you guys did enjoy it. And um, I do want to talk a little bit, though, about the whole idea of a rocket. Now, if we, as Americans, you know, we're trying to... Uh, think about, you know, actual rocket science here. Um, you know, when we take a rocket and we load it up with fuel and we're getting ready to take this rocket into outer space, one of the things that you have to consider is that we want to minimize the amount of mass that we load the rocket up with. So we really do have to maximize space and mass and, you know, if we're going to put astronauts in here, you know, we want to make sure that those astronauts are going to be safe and that the fuel that we load up on the bottom of this rocket is going to be adequate enough to project the rocket into outer space safely. So we don't want to put any unnecessary mass into there. And so I hope what you realize is when we're looking at this question, we want to make sure that um, there's going to be, um, or when we were using these rockets, obviously we wanted to make sure that the ratio of the hydrogen to oxygen gas was just right, just perfect enough to make the best rocket, to make it launch the furthest and to make it have the loudest pop. All right, and um, I think I asked this last class, I asked you guys, do you think the loudness of the pop is proportional to the amount of um, basically thrust that you got out of the rocket? In other words, do you think that the, the um, loudness that we were recording was um, a correlation, did it correlate with how far the rocket went? All right, and another thing to consider is that since we are talking about loudness, do you think that that was a proper um, way to, you know, collect data? Do you think maybe there could have been a better way to collect data? 
you know, these are all the thoughts that you should be thinking about as we're, you know, finishing this lab and looking at those post-lab questions. Because, you know, there is some error in this lab and it's not perfect. And I know some of you guys were even struggling even to get the actual darn rockets to launch. You know, some of you guys were not very successful at getting the rockets to actually go. But anyway, all right, so let's take a look at the warm-up question one more time. And what we're going to do is we're going to figure out the maximum amount of water that one part of hydrogen can make. So we're going to think about this reaction first. And then we're going to see um, how much um, water the five parts can make. All right, so we're going to look at that problem in a second. So it looks like we need to do two setups because basically what we're trying to determine is which one of these reactants is going to run out on us. Because um, eventually, I hope you'll see that it's not a perfect reaction, right? If it was a perfect um, ratio, we would have had twice as much hydrogen as there is oxygen. And we've actually got the opposite situation going on right here. Um, so I know that one of these reactants is going to run out on me. All right, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to um, try to figure out how much water this uh, one part of hydrogen can make. So um, the mole ratio between hydrogen and water is 2 to 2. All right, you see the coefficient right here, 2, and the water here is 2. We need to make sure that we're cross-canceling with the right stuff. So if I've got hydrogen on the top, I need to make sure that I cross-cancel with hydrogen down below, and I'm using the balanced reaction to find that ratio. So I'm going to put 2 moles or parts, okay, we can interchange those words, 2 moles of hydrogen go on the bottom, and we're trying to figure out the maximum amount of water, so I'm going to put water on the top. All right, the two and the two cancel, so this guy can make a maximum of one part or one mole of um, water. All right, now I'm going to set up the next one. Uh, we've got five parts of oxygen, and the ratio between oxygen and water is one to two, and we just need to make sure that we're cross-canceling with the right stuff. So I'm going to put oxygen down on the bottom. One mole or one part Oxygen should give us two parts, or two moles, of water. Okay, that's that mole ratio. So, gosh, don't you wish you could have actually made ten parts water? But you see how you have two different answers here? Because we technically were given two different quantities. And it's just like when you're sitting down and you're ready to make um, a bunch of sandwiches for your friends. Maybe you're having a party and you pull out all of the bread, all of the meat, and all of the cheese. Those are your, like your reactants. And gosh darn it, maybe, I don't know, maybe you just don't have enough bread. So the bread is going to limit the number of sandwiches that you can make. And what we have here is we have a situation where the hydrogen actually limited the maximum amount of water that we can make. The maximum amount of water that we can make was only one part of water, one part water. Which means that technically in this situation, the hydrogen ran out. So hydrogen is our limiting reactant and it's completely gone. So in order to make this one part water, it did require some of this oxygen. But did it require all of the oxygen to make that one part of water? Well, no. No, it did not. It did not take, require that much oxygen to make that much water. So we're going to figure out now, and this is the last part of the question, we know that the oxygen is in excess. We have some excess oxygen left over. But now we're going to figure out just exactly how much oxygen is left over. So this requires a third problem, okay, a third setup. Um, there's two different ways that you can go about this, but the way that I like to do it is I'm like, okay, I know that I made one part of this water, right? How much oxygen did it take to make that water. That's my thought process. So I know that I made one part of water. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to figure out how much oxygen it took to make that one part of water. So come back to the balanced reaction. The ratio between water and oxygen is 2 to 1. You need to make sure that you're putting those parts in correctly. So for one part of water, I'm going to put down on the bottom the ratio from the balanced reaction. It takes two parts of water down on the bottom. See, I'm cross-canceling. And that will be equivalent to one part of oxygen. And I could say parts or moles. It doesn't matter. You can do both. But 1 divided by 2 gives me 0.5. So 0.5 parts 
of oxygen. Now you just need to think, what does this number mean? What does this value mean? This is the amount of oxygen that was required to make the maximum amount of water in the original problem. In other words, to make this one part of water, it would require 0.5 parts of oxygen. Now, look at how much was originally available. We originally had five parts of oxygen. We didn't use all of it. We only used 0.5 of it. 0.5 of that, of that original amount was used. So we actually had quite a bit of oxygen left over. The question is, how much oxygen is left over? So what you're going to do is you're going to start with your five parts. This is what was originally available to us, five parts of oxygen. And we only use 0.5, so all I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract. All right, so subtract that amount. And guys, the amount left over would be 4.5 parts of oxygen. This is the amount right here left over. Left over. All right, so that should help you guys a lot with some of your post lab questions. So think about what I just did. Look at the screen. Look at this. It took one, two, three bits of information in order to calculate how much was maximum allowed to be made and how much was left over and which one was left over. All right, you guys, I hope this helps. Um, go ahead and stop the video right now. And at this point, allow some students enough time to finish this lab. They've got some post-lab questions. Don't forget the graph on part 11 of the procedure. Don't forget the graph. I'm also expecting you guys to show your work for the, um, I think it's post-lab question number three. So you should be showing your work and you should have a graph and you need to staple that to your original lab and then turn it in. All right, go ahead and pause the video. And then when the video continues, basically what I'm going to be doing is looking at the study guide with you guys. Yay! Okay, now that we're continuing the video, at this point I want to make sure that you have the study guide out and you have a calculator, a periodic table and everything, and obviously your study guide, a handout of your study guide. So if you need any extra handouts, by the way, for the lab or the study guide, um, those can be found over in the folder file for honors chemistry on the side of the room. Okay. But anyway, um, so I've already started a video um, last class and um, during IC, I think, and I posted that video already. Um, what we're going to do now is just continue from where I left off. So I'm taking, checking out question number five at this point. All right, so question number five. It says, if 4.6 grams of hydrogen peroxide decomposes into water and oxygen gas, how many molecules of oxygen gas can I produce? So obviously we have to start with the balanced reaction. We can't do anything without a balanced reaction. And I think by now you're pretty familiar with the formula for hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. All right, so um, we've already shown how to balance this, but I thought I'd just kind of inspire you one more time just to kind of look at it. Over on the left, you have um, two hydrogens. And over on the right, you also have two hydrogens, so that's set. Over on the left, you have two oxygen. But then over on the right, careful, You've got one oxygen on that water, and you have two oxygens on the actual oxygen gas. So over on the left, you have two oxygens, and on the right, you actually have three. All right, so think about how to balance that, okay? Um, it's kind of tricky, but over on the right side, you see that, that lone oxygen sitting on the water? It's just sitting there by itself. Well, on the left, no matter what you do, you're always going to have you know, an even number of oxygens. So you have to make it so that on the right side, you're somehow going to have an even value for the number of oxygen atoms. So if you think creatively and you kind of think clever here, what we're going to do is we're going to have to get an even value on the number of oxygens on the right-hand side. So the best strategy here would be to take this lone oxygen that you see right here and let's go ahead and mark it up. Let's get, let's get some more oxygen going right there. Okay, but when you marked up that uh, oxygen on the right-hand side, um, yeah, you got like uh, two oxygens here, two oxygens here, so that gives you four oxygens total. But um, what you also unfortunately did is you also increased the amount of hydrogen. So now you've actually got four hydrogen, 
and look grand total for oxygen on the right. So now I'm just going to balance that out by sticking a 2 over there. All right, so the question started us with 4.6 grams of hydrogen peroxide and is asking us to get to molecules of oxygen. So starting on the, uh, with what they gave us, which is the 4.6 grams, H2O2, I'm going to be doing a dimensional analysis problem that should make me end with molecules of oxygen. So we're going from here to here, and we are going to make sure that we start with mass but end in molecules on this side. All right, so you're starting with mass. Remember, we can't do much with mass. We love, um, however, we love moles. So we're going to have to convert that mass into moles so that we can use the balanced reaction, which is mole ratios. All right, so take a minute. Um, I've got a couple oxygens, got a couple hydrogens, um, and I'm sick, so I'm sure I'm going to be making mistakes. I really hope I don't make a mistake in the video, though. So I'm going to double check myself. I got a molar mass of 34 grams for the hydrogen peroxide. So 34 grams is equivalent to one mole of hydrogen peroxide. You always have to cross cancel grams with grams. So I'm going to put that 34.0 grams down on the bottom. And remember, that's equivalent to one mole of this stuff. Okay, now that I got rid of my grams, I need to make sure that I cross cancel with the correct moles of stuff because now we're in we're ready for the mole mole ratio once you hit moles you can get into that mole mole ratio so come back up to the balanced reaction mole mole ratio here is two to one make sure you're cross canceling hydrogen peroxide with hydrogen peroxide so from the balanced reaction there's two moles of hydrogen peroxide for every one mole of oxygen so just cross cancel correctly i'm going to put hydrogen peroxide down on the bottom and oxygen on the top. Okay, bravo. Mole hydrogen peroxide, mole hydrogen peroxide crossed off. Now we just need to end in molecules. Okay, don't let the word molecules scare you. You guys know what to do. How many molecules are in a mole? That's right, Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So you have moles on the top, you have to put moles down here. And you should just remember that that big fat number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, is equivalent to one mole of stuff. So I'm going to put one mole of my oxygen is equivalent to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, and that's molecules. All right, there you go. So here's the setup. Here's the plan. Anything on the top gets multiplied, and anything on the bottom gets divided. All right, take a minute to see if you get the right answer here. Hold on. All right, I got 4.0723, and it keeps going, times 10 to the 22nd. Um, mole ratios don't count for um, sig figs. So this initial mass of 4.6 is really going to limit us on our um, ability to report values. So I only want to report two, but I'm just going to check that last guy to see if I need to round up. And you do. So this is going to be 4.1 times 10 to the 22nd molecules of oxygen. Final answer. Okay, in problem number six, it's talking about uh, copper. I'm going to read it out loud. It says, if I could react 5.3 times 10 to the 45th atoms of copper with plenty of oxygen, how many grams of copper 2 oxide could I produce? And I'm trying to lead you in the problem to what the reaction looks like. You know, you've got some copper. It's being combined with oxygen to produce, you know, copper 2 oxide. So copper 2, the 2 means that the copper has a positive 2 and oxygen has a charge of negative 2. So you're making a compound in the end and the charges are all nice and balanced. But what do I have to do to the overall reaction before I start doing any math? That's right, you've got to balance it. So you'll notice that you have two oxygens on the left but only one on the right. So we'll fix that like that. And then now we've got two coppers on the right. So I'll fix that right there. All right, now that you have a balanced reaction, you can actually think about the problem. The problem is starting you with atoms of copper, and it says that you've got plenty of oxygen, but they want to know how many grams of copper 2 oxide you can make. So you're starting with atoms of copper. And you need to make sure that you are going from atoms of copper 
to grams of copper oxide. So this is the, the thought process. All right, so stoichiometry problem. You're starting with atoms. Don't let that scare you. How many atoms are in a mole, guys? Just always ask yourself that. It's like you're trying to get to moles. We need to get a mole-mole ratio, right? So there should be 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms in a mole of copper. There you go. So atoms, atoms crossed off. Now that you're on copper and uh, you're on moles of copper, we can jump into a mole-mole ratio. Looks like the mole-to-mole -mole ratio between these uh, two is 2 to 2. You just need to line it up correctly, okay? So if we've got moles of copper on the top, we got to put moles of copper on the bottom. And I'm using the balanced reaction to figure out what that ratio should be. So for every 2 moles of copper, we should make 2 moles of copper oxide. One more step because they didn't want us to figure out how many moles of copper oxide we can make. They wanted us to figure out how many moles, or I'm sorry, how many grams of copper oxide. Okay, so find your periodic table and let's just get the molar mass here for copper. Copper is 63.5. All right, so I'm gonna take 63.5 and I'm gonna add my oxygen, which is 16. I got a molar mass of 79.5 grams. So where should I put the 79.5 grams at the end? This is what one mole of copper is equivalent to. So that's right, you gotta cross cancel your copper oxide. So for every one mole of copper oxide, it should weigh 79.5 grams. There you go, now you're all lined up, okay? So let's solve this. Take a minute, grab your calculator. And make sure you're typing in that uh, scientific notation correctly. You're going to type in 5.3e to the 45, and then you've got to divide that by 6.02e to the 23, because that number's on the bottom. All right, and the twos and the twos kind of cancel, so I'll just kind of skip over that. All right, so I get an awful lot of grams, and I'm going to explain why that makes sense. Hold on. Times 10 to the 23 grams. All right, this is kind of crazy. Um, let me just double check that one more time. I think that's right. 5.3 e to the 45, 6.02, 3, and then times 79.5. Yeah, okay. All right, so um, let's see, I'm looking around here. Probably two sig figs, one, two. Do I need to round the last one up? Yes. And when it does round up, all right, it's going to change the 9 to a 0 and then increase that 6 to a 7. So this is going to be 7.0 times 10 to the 23 grams of copper oxide. Okay. And the reason why this kind of makes sense is because if you look at this initial um, number of atoms, you see this uh, times 10 to the 45 and then you're dividing it by 10 to the 23. That still leaves behind quite a few atoms. Okay, quite, quite a few. And uh, that's why it's going to be several moles of copper. All right, so that one's all done. All right, in question number seven, it says if I react calcium acetate with potassium carbonate, what will be the precipitate? All right, so I hope you have your periodic table. Let's take a look at calcium, element number 20. What's calcium's charge going to be? It's a positive two. And it says calcium acetate. So you got to find the acetate ion. Eights and ites are on your list. Acetate is C2H3O2, and it has a negative one charge. All right, acetate is obviously polyatomic, and it looks like we need more than one. So we're going to wrap that guy in parentheses and put a two on the outside, just to balance the charges. All right, so it says calcium acetate is reacting with potassium carbonate. Okay, so potassium, element K. Um, I think it's uh, element 19 and it has a positive one charge. Okay, potassium carbonate. Carbonate should be on your list, CO3, and it has a negative two charge. All right, so you got to balance this, the charges out by getting another potassium on there. All right, so that compound is ready. All right, now it just says that it reacts and it wants to know if any uh, precipitates are going to be able to make. 
So looking at the two reactants, you need to be able to predict your products. So the best way to do that is to figure out what kind of reaction this is. And I hope you guys can see that you've got two very obvious ionic compounds reacting. And if you have two reaction or I'm sorry, two reactants that are both compounds, this should look like a double replacement to you. So this metal right here is going to try to find something that it can pair up with on the other side. Remember, metals don't like to be, you know, hooked up to another metal. All right, metals are both positively charged when they turn into an ion, so they're not going to like each other very much. Calcium's new buddy has to have a negative charge, and that's going to be your carbonate. So calcium carbonate will be one of your products, and always check your charges. Now you may have already, um, like, I don't know if you remember, but we already wrote down those charges. So here's your calcium carbonate, plus two, minus two, it's perfect. Let's look at your other product. The other product is going to come from potassium hooking up with someone else. Potassium is going to want acetate. So just because you have two potassiums on the left doesn't mean you're going to have two potassiums on the right. Remember, we're going to rebalance all of these charges. Oh, uh, C, sorry, C2H3O2. There we go. Potassium is positive one. Acetate is negative one. Okay, so that compound is balanced. Now the whole reaction is not quite balanced yet. Okay, we can take care of that real quick. Um, over on the left, you see this acetate ion, the big fat ion. Where'd it go? Here it is. On the left, you only have one, but on the right, or I'm sorry, on the left you have two, and on the right you only have one. So I'm going to make two acetates by sticking a two in the front. All right, um, let's see. You have two potassiums on the left, but now that I place that coefficient in the front right there, you also have two potassiums on the right. One carbonate on the left, one carbonate, one calcium, one calcium. So the reaction is all set. All right, now they just want to know if a precipitate has been made. So all you guys have to do now is check your solubility rules. Okay, and that's on the back of your periodic tables. Easy. Um, if you look at your solubility rules, it says that all acetates are soluble. Remember what soluble means, okay? Soluble means able to dissolve. And do you guys remember the um, symbol for something that is able to dissolve? Yeah, it's AQ. That's the symbol. AQ means aqueous. This is a good review. Now, if something is not able to dissolve, and we sometimes say it's insoluble. Insoluble means unable to dissolve. And if it's unable to dissolve, that means it should be in the solid state. So we'll put a little symbol of S, and S stands for solid. All right, so um, on your solubility rules, it says that all acetates are soluble. So I'm going to label this guy with the acetate, the potassium acetate on the product. He is soluble, so that's not our precipitate. All right, because what is a precipitate? A precipitate is an insoluble solid that is being produced. So if you look at carbonate, okay, it says uh, on carbonates, double check what it says, and I think that the calcium says that it's an exception to carbonates. It says all carbonates are soluble except certain ones. I can't remember exactly what it says at this time, but that guy right there is definitely going to be your precipitate. All right, on question number eight, all this is is a bunch of practice with getting molar mass. So um, the best thing to make sure that you guys can do is to see the name of a compound and be able to get its formula. So this is a bit of review from last unit, and I'll just do one of them with you, okay? Magnesium nitrate. Magnesium is element number 12. He has a positive 2 charge. Nitrate, eights and ites, come from your list. Nitrate is NO3, and it has a negative 1 charge. So to make a proper compound out of this guy, you're going to want to wrap the nitrate in parentheses and stick a 2 on the outside. All right, now it's time to just double check your molar masses. So make sure you have a periodic table with you. Okay. And it looks like the molar mass for magnesium is 24.3. 
Okay, the molar mass of nitrogen is 14.0, and the molar mass of oxygen is 16.0. Now you just need to make sure that you're getting the right numbers, quantities. Magnesium does not have a subscript, so there's only one. The two is on the outside of these parentheses, right, for the polyatomic ion. And just like in math, whenever you have a number on the outside of a parentheses, you have to draw it inside. Okay. So you actually have two nitrogens and six oxygens. Okay. So at this point, you can either use a calculator or whatever you want, but um, multiply this out. And let's see if you get the right answer. This is just really good practice for you guys. All right, and I got a grand total of 148.3 grams per mole. All right, I'm not going to do all of these. You guys can continue to work on that on your own. I'm going to actually skip ahead to problem number nine. Problem number nine gives you um, a few sample problems and asks you whether or not these are going to work. Here's the key thing that you've got to be able to do. You need to identify what type of reaction these are. If they are a single replacement reaction, the thing that makes single replacement reactions work is the metal reactivity series. Okay, and the way that it works is you'll typically have, you know, this is kind of like a general form for, you know, a metal reactivity series. Okay, this is like the general form. Element A, the loner, this element right here needs to be higher in reactivity than the metal that it is replacing. All right, so this lone guy needs to be the guy that is capable of cutting into that reaction. All right, for a double replacement reaction, what you need to check is your solubility rules because what we need for a double replacement reaction to work is we have to make that precipitate. All right, a precipitate or the formation of water. Okay, so now you've got to be double checking the solubility. You've got to be able to make a uh, precipitate of some kind of solid, insoluble product. All right, so let's take a look at a few of these. Uh, part A says that you've got copper trying to cut in on silver nitrate. So this lone metal has to be higher in reactivity. So take a pause and double check your metal reactivity series. All right, so copper is definitely more reactive than silver. So this reaction is going to work. You are going to make some copper nitrate, and then the silver is going to pop off and be alone. You just have to check charges. Now, copper can have multiple charges. I think I remember telling you that it's typically a positive two. Nitrate here is a negative one. So to make this compound you know, neutral, I'm gonna have to go like that. And to make the entire reaction balanced, I'm gonna have to get a couple nitrates on the left, and then because I put that two in front of something that has silver, I'm gonna to need to put a two on the right. And this reaction does work. All right, now I'm gonna skip down to F and take a look at this reaction. What you've got is you got silver nitrate, and it looks like lead acetate, C2H3O2. And you gotta double that, okay. Now, in order for this particular reaction work, this is a double replacement, we need to be able to identify some kind of precipitate in the product side. So I'm going to rearrange everything. Silver is going to be looking for a new buddy, and that's going to be your acetate ion. And if you want to check your charges, your silver is plus one, acetate is minus, oops, sorry, minus one. So this is a beautiful balanced uh, compound. Let's see what the other compound is going to be. Who's lead going to be hooking up with? Yeah, nitrate. Now, if you're curious about the charge of lead, um, you see how there's two acetates on there? If there's two acetates, each acetate is negative one. And you see how we use two of them? That means that this lead has to have a positive two charge. Nitrate always has a negative one. So I'm going to go like that and predict my products. Yeah, get, that, get that compound's um, formula correct. All right, now, check your solubility rules. And this is going to be kind of interesting. All right, in the solubility rules, um, this is an acetate. It says all acetates are soluble with no exceptions. Now look at nitrate. It says all nitrates are soluble, no exceptions. Remember, soluble means aqueous, able to dissolve. 
So if both of these guys are aqueous, did any reaction happen? Nope, no reaction happened. This reaction does not work. NR. Why? Because you have all soluble products. All right, guys, um, I'm going to show you one more problem, and it's towards the bottom. I realize that I am skipping, but I'm sure you guys have questions on this one. All right, so I'm skipping all the way down to the bottom. I'm going to check out problem number 12. Okay, in problem number 12, it says balance the following reaction, and then analyze the picture, and actually draw out the resulting products, and be sure to include any excess or leftover reactant that did not react fully. All right, so the reaction in question is this. We've got uh, CH4 and then O2, and I hope you guys realize what that looks like. That looks like a combustion reaction, and it should be making CO2 and H2O. So take a pause, and we got to balance the reaction. Remember, we can't do anything without a balanced reaction. All right, so I see two, or I'm sorry, four hydrogen on the left, but only two on the right. Okay, so let's balance that out. Okay, and that gave me a total of four oxygens on the right. So I'm going to balance that out right there. Okay, so at first this might seem a little bit confusing, but um, let's take a look at what you have available to you. This is just like your micro rocket lab. Basically what we have is we have three parts, if you will, of CH4, right? Because I see three molecules, one, two, three. And then if you look at the O2s, it looks like I've got, let's see, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight. Looks like I have eight, if you will, parts of O2. All right, and uh, basically we're going to do the same thing that we would normally do in any kind of, um, like we did in the micro rocket lab. And you see how, like, we got to figure out how much of everything that we made. So you can either, um, like, literally draw in your products and think about how those atoms are going to rearrange, or you can do just a little bit of math. So if I have three parts, and I'm going to abbreviate three parts, CH4, why don't we go ahead and figure out, um, let's just go to CO2. Let's go to CO2 on both of those. Let's figure out how much carbon dioxide um, each of these is going to get. So I'm going to also do my eight parts of O2. Okay, and on both of these I'm going to go to CO2 just to see the maximum amount of CO2 that I can make. Okay, so if I have three parts of CH4 for every one part of CH4, it looks like I can make one part CO2. I'm going to do the same thing down below, but remember I'm using O2, so look at the balanced reaction. For every two parts of O2, I can make one part CO2. All right, looks like I've got three parts of CO2 on the first one, and on the second one, I've got four parts of CO2. So what's the maximum CO2 that I can make? Looks like the maximum I can make is three parts CO2. All right, so when I draw my, my end, um, in my end picture, looks like I'm only going to be able to make three CO2s. So this is what carbon looks like, right? Just a black one. And see, oxygen was that gray thing. So I'm going to draw two gray things attached. Now, how many of these can I make? Max? Three. So in my final drawing, I'm going to make sure that I have three of those max. So it looks like all of the CH4 is going to be gone, right? Because that was my limiting reagent. So in my end picture, the CH4 has to be gone. But now I hope you realize that the oxygen should be left over, right? Did we use all of the oxygen to make these three CO2s? Well, no. Let's figure out how much oxygen I actually had to use. So I know that I can make a maximum of three parts CO2. Okay, let's try to figure out exactly how much oxygen it took to make that. All right, so look at the balanced reaction for every one part, CO2. Looks like um, for oxygen, I need two parts of oxygen. All right, so that's going to give me six parts of O2. So did I have six parts to begin with? No, it looks like I have eight. You see, we counted over here, eight of them. 
but it only took six of them to make our three CO2s. So I'm actually only going to be drawing in my final picture. It looks like I'm only going to be um, drawing an additional, see how we originally had eight and we only used six. I better be able to see two O2s left over. So my final drawing, you remember the gray? Oops, wrong color. There we go. I should have left over, O2 left over. And how many? Look at the difference. What is the difference between eight and six? There should be two of these guys left over. Okay, so we should have two oxygen left over. None of the CH4 is going to be there. Now the next question you should be asking to yourself is how much water are we going to have in the end? All right, so I know that I made a maximum of three parts CO2, right? Maximum of three parts CO2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually do a ratio to figure out how many, if I made, if I made, technically, if I made three parts of CO2, how much water should also be there if I made three parts CO2? So I'm going to go to the um, ratio here between CO2 and H2O. For every one part of CO2, there should be two parts of H2O in there. All right, so three times two is six. That means that we should have six parts of water in that final drawing because we were also able to make six parts of H2O. So in my drawing, I'm going to need to make some water. Hydrogen is gray, right? Okay, H2O, there should be two of these. All right, and then, yeah, hydrogen. Oh, shoot, wrong color, sorry. Hydrogen should be just blank, black circle, sorry. So there should be blank circle right there. There we go. And then the oxygen should be your gray. There, like this. All right, now how many of these waters do I need to draw? looks like six waters. All right, so I just figured out exactly what should be in the final drawing. We're not going to have any CH4. The CH4 should be gone. We should have six waters, three CO2s, and then two of the O2s, and that's everything that should be left in the final drawing. Okay. All right, guys, that's all with the time that I've got for now. Um, any further questions, you can always email me, and um, I hope you guys are ready for your test next class. All right, you guys, good luck. Peace out.